<laughs> Whoa. Trinidadian society. <laughs> I have to laugh. Anything is possible. But we're looking at what is possibly going to be a 60, 70, 100 year process. To begin with, we're not by and large very open minded people. I think that they should not legalize abortion because every person has a right. You never know that child who you are aborting could be the child who could come up with the, with the, um, the cure for AIDS or some string of cancer. So I don't think abortion should be legalized. You no. Know, if it is a well educated about pregnancy and thing and you know you're not ready for a child, they shouldn't have any practices whatsoever, premarital sex and whatnot. If you make abortion that one less person in the society, for the benefit of the society. One of the things that a lot of people seem still not to be aware of is that abortions are legal in Trinidad and Tobago. My name is Glenis Hyacinth. I am the executive director of Advocates for Safe Parenthood, Improving Reproductive Equity, fondly known as ASPIRE. There's the feeling that it's illegal, but no, it is, it, 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 it is legal. But it's legal under certain circumstances to save the life of the mother, to preserve the mental and physical health of the mother. And what we are advocating that it be made more broadly legal to encompass rape and incest, contraceptive um, failure. Economic reasons, you know, for a woman making the decision to terminate a pregnancy. The premise of, of our organization is that we respect women's right to choose. Aspire is giving the impression that, that abortion is now legal in Trinidad. My name is Leela Ramdeen and I'm the chair of the Catholic Commission for Social Justice I'm in the Catholic Church in Trinidad and Tobago. Unfortunately, the public, I'm a lawyer, so I know and many other lawyers would know, but the general public may not be aware that what Aspire is referring to is a, a UK case called R and Born, where a doctor had, um, in, in, the, in those days, in 1967, around that time, abortion was illegal in England. And a doctor and a few people wanted to test the courts, and so he aborted uh, the baby of, of a child, who a, a person who it was felt would become a mental wreck if she went ahead to have the baby. And their law was changed. Arenborn is what we call case law now, because it was a case that was brought to court and led to the change of the law. In Trinidad, we have our own statute, the Offenses Against the Persons Act. Statute is supreme. First of all, there's a misconception, which Aspire has pointed out, that the law bans all abortions. Kevin Balio Singh, freelance writer, novelist and a journalist. Well, of course, it doesn't do that. What it does is that it leaves a certain leeway up to the doctor. The problem is doctors in Trinidad society are not proactive people. They're not going to take the risk, okay? So what happens is done surreptitiously. Um, and for that to change, the law has to be made much clearer. In Trinidad and Tobago, not at all. They went to look for it, let them bring the child. Yes. No abortion should not here. It's not England. We in Trinidad. The current law in Trinidad and Tobago is quite undeveloped and restrictive, and it is also ambiguous. Undeveloped and restrictive because it stems from 18th century legislation, which was imported into Trinidad at the time of the reception of our law in colonial times. I am Lynette Seberan Sweet, and for too many years um, to count, I've been an attorney at law in private practice, operating in Port of Spade in Trinidad and Tobago. And we have the law prohibiting abortion 
in the Offenses Against the Person Act, which is a, a catch-all piece of legislation that was designed to codify many common law offenses that had always been known to the common law in the United Kingdom surrounding the area of assault. And ironically enough, the legislation was first introduced really to protect women from backstreet abortionists. There are two sections, sections 56 and 57 of the Offenses Against the Person Act that was first enacted in the 1860s in Trinidad and Tobago and has not been um, reformed since. The law provides that any woman who procures an abortion by administering to herself anything or by using any instrument on herself is guilty of an offense and, and is liable to imprisonment for four years. Any person who assists the woman by procuring for her the noxious thing or the instrument is guilty of an offense as well and is liable to uh, of a maximum penalty of two years imprisonment. Now both sections speak of these offenses being committed unlawfully, obviously implying that there are situations in which uh, an abortion can be performed lawfully. When we look at the ethical codes under which the doctors have always operated, we learn that there has always been known to medical ethics a doctrine known as the doctrine of necessity, which means that a medical doctor has a duty when faced with a live born patient before him, a woman who is in whatever stage of pregnancy. If the pregnancy compromises her life or seriously compromises her health, the duty of the doctor is to preserve the life of the patient with whom he's dealing and if it becomes necessary to terminate the pregnancy to perform an abortion, that is his duty. The legislation that we're proposing really recognizes that the further along a pregnancy goes, the more value is placed on the whole issue of the fetus. And therefore we are saying within the first trimester, she should be allowed. When you start getting into the second trimester, which is up to 24 weeks, a woman would be under the circumstances of rape and incest. Of course, the whole saving her life, preserving the mental and physical health in consultation or with the recommendation of a doctor. Abortion and abortion law reform are things that affect young people actually more you know, deeply than they affect the rest of the population so that we could not remain out of it. Hello, my name is Salon McDonald. I'm the first vice president of the Trinidad Youth Council. Um, also work at the YMCA in the position of community outreach coordinator and also the vice president of the Trinidad and Tobago Coalition on the Rights of the Child. While we're not into the rhetoric of it and you know the shooting back and forth, we know that our involvement is key because our constituents, which is the youth of Trinidad, really, really are seriously affected. And we cannot just sit by the sidelines and watch things happen. Let me state the Youth Council's position. Um, it's not about us liking abortion, right? because realistically, nobody likes abortion. Our position is simple. The law as it stands does not deal with the reality, okay? It's ambiguous about legally, or illegally administering a noxious substance or illegally procuring an abortion. If you're doing something stated illegally, then it sort of insinuates that there would be a legal position. And it's that ambiguity that we understand causes a lot of stress and trouble. The document that was produced by Aspire, um, Women's Choice in Pregnancy, um, it's called a bill, but it is not a bill. For it to become a bill, it has to be supported by a member of the Senate or of Parliament itself. This is a document that has been drafted. It has not been laid before Parliament. It cannot be laid by an individual group. It has to be embraced by a member of the Senate or of, of the House of Representatives. Um, when that document came out, um, remember, since our work is to promote justice, our aim then was to share our perspective as Catholics in the same way as other religious groups, other faith communities. We're very diverse, as you know, in Trinidad and Tobago. We have a number of different faith communities, and many of them have spoken out. We have an interreligious organization that issued a statement as well, making it clear that the different religious groups that repre are represented on that interreligious organization do not 
promote, do not support the concept of reproductive rights. The Islamic position is that if the, a mother's life is in danger, no matter at what stage of pregnancy, the termination of the pregnancy is the lesser of the two evils. If her life is at stake, not if her health, uh, you know, is, is, is somehow or the other going to be damaged. My name is Siddiq Ahmad Nasser. I am the Amir, the head of the Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama Institute. Rape and incest, Islam does not uphold that, that you should have an abortion if pregnancy occurred because of rape or incest. I think generally the Mahasabha will will take up the same position. Sat Maharaj, I'm Secretary General of the Hindu organization known as the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha. That, listen, uh, for health reasons, it's imperative that you terminate life. You don't abandon one life to save another life. I believe that in the case of uh, rape and in the case of incest, that's my personal view, that is my view, that is my modern view, my Western view, is that in cases like these, there must be a choice to terminate or not to terminate. In Hinduism, you have what is called the Dharma Shastras or the law books as such. Some say, uh, note it, in fact, the main law book, the Manusmriti, says definitely that abortion is murder, killing the child basically, right? A big sin, a large sin. But the other law books state that, you know, that under certain circumstances, that if the mother's health is uh, in danger, right, or other factors, it could be done. I am Prakash Prasad, uh, senior lecturer at the University of West Indies, and also chairman of Swahe Incorporated. So if there is no fixed position, you know, that yes, it's a sin, but Hinduism understands that, you know, there may be times and circumstances that you need to look at, and you, you know, there are times for the greater good you may need to commit a sin. I, I don't really agree with it. But it has certain situations which, which you know that the mother or the father cannot really make a, a good effort to bring up that child. And they, they, they're forced within the, the, the grounds to um, make that um, decision to not bring the child into this world. Aspire drafted a piece of legislation which, you know, based on consultation or based on discussion and looking at laws, globally because it was not something done just you know in, in isolation and what we did is that we pulled from all the laws globally to get something that we felt that is good and would really represent the whole issue of valuing life and valuing the rights of, of a woman to make a decision either which way um, because usually when you think about choice people think especially when we in the when we're talking about abortion you're saying that the choice is always to, to have a termination. But for us, we're saying that the choice is to do many things, one of which would be to terminate. I've, you know, looked at the proposed legislation and in a lot of ways it's, you know, it's supportive in that it seeks to institute a procedure to deal with things, uh, you know, clear counseling, guidelines, support structures and whatnot. And those things are good and, you know, they are relevant. It's just that, like so many other proposed bits of legislation, we worry about real enforcement. We do not believe that law reform alone is going to achieve the objective of our campaign of bringing about an amelioration of this terrible public health problem for women. We believe also that women must have access to information and counseling both before and after the procedure. And this has been enshrined in the legislation. The reproductive rights group give the impression that a woman has a right to her body, has a right to choose whether, in fact, whatever she can do with her body, she, she can do. Unfortunately, we live in a time of what our recent Pope Benedict XVI called radical individualism. What does that mean? That means that if it feels good, you do it. We live at a time when people have become very selfish. We seem to have forgotten that we have, while we have rights, we also have responsibilities and that freedom is relative. You find that there's a subtle undercurrent or even more blatant than I think that women, you know, are not in full control of their bodies or of their lives. My name is Jamie Leloy, I'm an independent filmmaker and I've recently completed a 45 minute documentary called Protest, which is on young mothers in Trinidad. And you'll find that, okay, if, if I were to get pregnant now, per se, just speaking, 
um, if I go and have this child and I'm not married, yes, I'm looked down upon. And at the same time, if I go and secretly have an abortion and no one knows about it, I probably will fare better than if I had come out and, and had the child because people would treat me, you know, the same. I wouldn't go through discrimination in the workplace and otherwise. But yet if someone finds out, I become, you know, a murderer. One of the things we recognize that we had to do is our research and you know aspire prides itself and being an evidence-based organization and we said okay we're talking we, we have a sense on the ground that the situation is bad but we really need concrete evidence we really need to do our research and the whole campaign started off by us conducting research in the public hospitals this research was done at Port of Spain General, San Fernando General, Point Fortin, Scarborough, San Grande, Mount Hope. We were convinced that our fears were really grounded. Because what that research showed is that every year, approximately 3,000 to 4,000 women end up in our public hospitals alone. We have no idea as to, in terms of research that is, as to what's going on in the private um, hospitals. I really agree that we need to do something to get statistics. But we have to do it properly and we have to do it fairly and not just to bump up the numbers on one side or the other. And why do I say this? We need those statistics to ensure that as a nation we're not hiding our heads in the sand like ostriches and pretending that abortions are not taking place. What we don't want to do is get emotional and pluck numbers and figures out of the air. So in my view, we need to work with the Minister of Health and, um, and his ministry and the doctors and others to find some way of determining whether to differentiate between spontaneous abortion and abortions that were conducted otherwise. The data that Aspire has on the abortions in Trinidad and Tobago is actually data from the Ministry of Health's own reports. My name is Fred Nunes. I have worked in a number of places with the University of the West Indies, the United Nations Development Programme, with the World Bank, joined the World Health Organization. I retired just recently, so I am now free of work. These abortions are classified by the International um, Classification of Diseases. And in there, you have a very interesting thing. It will say, for example, and I'm using figures approximately, legal abortions, five. Other abortions, 3,000. That's the order of magnitude that we're talking about. So the data we are referring to are data generated by the Ministry of Health Statistical Unit. We are not saying that abortions are good and great and hey what, there's no big deal. We're not saying that. What we're saying is that women, couples, families are faced with difficult situations at times and one of the options that women choose is to terminate and we are saying that once that person has all the information available to her, or to them I should say, then we respect that woman's choice to make that decision. And the whole moral and religious aspect of it, though very important, is something that needs to be dealt with at a personal level. The law, the state, has an obligation to address the situation as such. The issue about a woman's fundamental human right to choose to do what she likes if she has something growing in her, in her womb and she wants to get rid of it. What about the fundamental right to life of that individual who is growing in the woman's womb? Now, the Aspire group and other pro-choice pro group will tell you that that's not a human being. That what's growing in a woman's um, womb is either not a human being or not a person. We had a, a conference recently um, at which Aspire members spoke and Father Henry Charles um, who, is, who spoke on ethics and abortion and he rightly says there is no stage at which some, somebody grows into personhood. Personhood is not something you evolve into. You're a person from the time you get your DNA. On the one hand, as I said, you have the right of the fetus, and let, let me not be taken for an instant to be getting into any, any ridiculous, unending debate as to whether a fetus is human life. Of course, a fetus is human life. And it is, it is not, however, a person for the purpose of recognition by the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, indeed, constitutions worldwide. If it is that fetal rights are desired by a society to be protected, legislation would need to, to 
to be promulgated for the purpose over and above what exists now. The zygote, right, lacks consciousness, lacks, um, well, at the extension of consciousness, emotional um, awareness, and lacks the capacity to feel pain, to suffer, and so on. So if we destroy that zygote, are we destroying a human being in the same way that if somebody came with a gun and shot you through the head, they're destroying a human being? That's, to me, an obviously absurd argument. In Islam, there is a, a distinction in that uh, generally the teachings of Islam uphold that the spiritual dimension of the human personality, the, uh, there's a difficulty with the, with the language here. In that developing embryo, it is from 120 days at 120 days that this actually begins, that the spiritual dimension is then, uh, you know, infused or whatever we may want to call it. It is a profoundly difficult moral question as to whether uh, a, a termination of a pregnancy at any stage is right or wrong. And when you get into the realm of morality, there is really no satisfactory answer to this question of whether terminating a pregnancy is right or wrong. There are very many people who hold an absolutist view that in all circumstances, and because from conception there is a potential for human life to be born, and there is human life there, that all termination of pregnancy is, and they go so far as to loosely use legal terms such as murder, and to get into very inflammatory and violent language, which tends to obscure the nuances and the, the, um, the, the complexities of the issues involved. A woman needs to be able to control when she has children, when she becomes pregnant. Now this need is a need which begins long before the stage where she gets pregnant, has sexual intercourse and gets pregnant. And so when you look at the entire spectrum of needs that women have in this area of sexual and reproductive health, it starts at the very earliest stages with the need for information and education at the early stages of our educational system and our acculturation in the home to the issues surrounding responsible sexual behavior, responsible family life, responsible family planning and responsible behavior on the whole. No, my mother never tell me about sex. Long time we didn't know about sex in plane coming from a, a, a baby coming from a plane. No, my parents didn't talk to me about sex, having sex. Yes, my parents have talked to me about sex. My, no, my parents never spoke to me about sex. How old are you? 20, 22. Yes, they talk to me about sex and I and I go along with it, you know. No, my parents haven't talked to me, talk to me about sex. Yes, my parents have talked to me about sex. My parents have talked to me about sex. I am 50, my mother never tell me I'm not a sex. As she said, we hear the baby come from there, you know, plane. aeroplane, <laughs> and this and that, and you know, all kind of stupidness. Aside from my friends, no one has ever spoken to me about sex. You find that a lot of young people find out about sex through their friends, through television, through other um, vent, you know, areas like that. In that respect, we really do need to have more sex education in schools and in the home. How can we not speak to young people about sex? Let them find out on their own, make whatever decisions and then persecute them afterwards, like if they were supposed to know everything. Essentially, our challenge with sexuality is puritanical. We are quite dichotomous in our approach to sexuality. You will have on the street one level of public behavior, of bacchanal, of carnival. So you have a physical demonstration of enormous sexuality. You have it in your advertisements every which way you look. Yet, it is an unspoken topic. It is not something that's discussed at the dinner table. There is not a mechanism in which parents speak to their children so that their children can learn about the travails of sexuality within their own lives as a result of which adolescents grow up in a profoundly innocent atmosphere or worse, an atmosphere poisoned by advertisements or poisoned by the public displays of sexuality but not informed by the morality or a bedrock of information about the biology of sexuality. 
sexual activity happens in Trinidad and Tobago and has been happening since the foundation of this society. Good teenage pregnancies then and now are not much different because I've actually reviewed the statistics at TPHL. Good? It's not that much different. The attitude is the same. We don't want it, we don't deal with it. The Hindu community is a very conservative community. In the past, they never spoke about sex openly. It was all in whispers. But sex is something that the Hindus have never run from. We produce the first manual on sex, the Kama Sutra, that the world has embraced. So we have never run from sex. But you know, we are very careful the way we propagate it and so on. Because of the new diseases that are easily spread, sexual diseases, especially HIV AIDS, we were the first grouping two years ago to publicly announce that we are going to discuss sex and HIV AIDS in our temples and in our schools and in our communities. Yeah, my, my mother talked to me about sex from the time I was 10 years old, 11. I always knew. Okay. Well, in schools, you never. Everybody should, and um, even in school, they should be t teaching children about sex from young. Yes, I think it should be taught in school because many um, teenagers nowadays practicing sex and things are like a teenage pregnancy and things going on in the country right now. Yes, I think sex education should be taught in schools. I, I think it should be taught in school and, and home too. Yes, I think it's very important, but I think you have to know how you talk about sex education in school so that you don't come across as just thinking it's okay to do it, you know. I think it's better if you can tell them what is safe because, I mean, nowadays we have, you know, teenagers who are doing it. So I think you need to tell them what it to do for safe and that it's not just okay because you think, you know, confuse love with sex. My personal views it should be taught both at home and at school. And I, I think that it needs to be done at school. From um, you can divide like sexual education at home. You know, you, you talk to your children about the sort of you know people you know your company you keep, etc. The sort of dangers, etc. That's your duty as, as a parent. But in the school system, I think you need to have a defined program from a point of view of biology, explaining what it is, explaining the impact on, on, on community health. We also have resistance to sex education in the school system. My name is Rhoda Redock and I am a professor here at the UWI and head of the Center for Gender and Development Studies. And in fact, I do feel that sex education in the school system could reduce unwanted pregnancies, could reduce the incidence of HIV AIDS, and could reduce uh, teenage parenting, all of which are problems I think the society is facing. The whole issue of information and education as it relates specifically to health and family life education in schools is also an area that Aspire has been working on, has been looking at, and, and think that needs to be addressed in a very serious way. Have you heard of a program called Health and Family Life Education? No, no. Actually, no, I've never heard of that program before. Never heard of a program called Health and what? And why I haven't heard about health and family, whatever, yeah. Well, it's health and family life education, and we usually refer to it as HFLE. I'm Joycelyn Ramsad, and I am a lecturer here at the School of Education in the areas of teacher education, science, and also health and family life education. It is unfortunate that sex education has come to be synonymous with HFLE. Now, although we have a policy for HFLE, we do not have really any implementation of HFLE in Trinidad and Tobago yet. This is really a program that is intended to build psychosocial competence in young people. HFLE really encompasses a number of thematic areas and underpinning all of these thematic areas is health and wellness. I think it's not an unreasonable position for the government to take, except if it becomes an exclusive position. I think every method that we can advocate that can increase sexual responsibility is to be pursued, every last one. If, however, the advocacy of abstinence becomes an exclusive moral position, then I think we're going to reap the most devastating consequences. The studies with which I am familiar in the States all 
all show that abstinence only education does not work. In terms of, you know, the drive towards sole abstinence and abstinence only education, we don't have a problem with abstinence as an option. But highlighting it as the only option and looking to abstinence only programming where you don't include information about contraception and you only include failure rates for condoms and that kind of thing, which, you know, a lot of the information is highly inaccurate. We think it's dangerous and we know it's dangerous. We are saying abstinence only programs don't work and cannot work. What we are saying is that there needs to be a comprehensive education program, which also includes abstinence. So there's certainly need to talk about abstinence, okay? But it cannot be a program that talks only about abstinence. I'm Dr. Spencer Perkins. I'm a specialist gynecologist and obstetrician, the president of the Gynecological and Obstetrical Society of Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, I remember going to church and so on. I always felt that abstinence was the correct thing to do. Whether we, whether we did it or not was something else, but I think it's not a new issue by any means. I think most churches, most religions, etc., promote the abstinence issue. I think it's good that they're bringing it back in schools and giving them some support groups and so on, because children should feel happy to not be sexually active. And from that point of view, I think it's, it's, um, it's an excellent program. Whether it will solve the problems they're looking to solve, that's another issue because there are all kinds of problems with it, especially in people's perception of what constitutes sexual intercourse, something as basic as that. Um, you know, that's, that's one issue. And um, it's, in the past, it hasn't yielded results that we have expected it to. It is no good saying abstain when the body is giving another message so that our take on this is that, listen, you have to use other mechanisms also. Abstinence is one way. That is, no sex before marriage, no trial marriage. I mean, that is the doctrine of Hinduism. Here's where we are at the abstinence campaign. We subscribe to the internationally approved, tried, tested ABC, Abstinence Be Faithful Condom we understand that the necessity of our situation deals with the reality. You have those three options in terms of behavior. Good, either no sex, mutually monogamous, or protected. We have to be realistic. Society has this way of constructing the perfect place. Society says you should be married, then you should have a child. Fine, I understand the logic in that. You know, but what about the people that got pregnant and they didn't plan it? What do you say now? You're telling them, you can't have it and you can't not have it, so where do you put them? I really feel that the context within which women have to deal with unwanted pregnancies in our society is very difficult, very unsupportive, and one that doesn't give them the freedom to really have all the information they need to make the right decision. Young women are going to get pregnant because there's a lot of sex going on and a lot of what I would call uninformed sexual activity. Oh, you got, where you got thing? This, this child get mislead, she get used. Yeah. You understand? She get used. You understand? You don't go for the child, but you get mislead, she get mislead. Well, probably, like, it could be her decision, it could not be a decision. Many things could be and couldn't be, you know? It's up to her, whatever, but I mean, if it's a situation where, you know, like she wasn't ready for it, I feel sorry for somebody like that. Because that's like something real important and shouldn't risk, you know, getting herself pregnant if you can't handle a child. Well, I will say she chose she life. You understand? She leave all she fruit here because you could always have a child. But you have to go to school and study to get your thing to make sure to get your fruit here. Well, I wonder if, um, if she is able to care for the child, if she is financially responsible, you know, able to... Um, to probably mold that child's mind if she is able to educate the child. Remember, a child can get educated by herself. Um, the parent has to be there. We're all not right. agreeing with that at all, at all in Trinidad, not here. They're supposed to have a special school that whenever they get pregnant, they put them in and don't mix them with the other children and them. Why is that? No, because what the example is showing. 
Yeah. You understand? You make a child, you come to school. I can make one come to school too. Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to have a different a private school that these children can go at and attend too. Then they're going back in the same school and not agree with that one. You'd find even that non-religious people who think that they're liberal will still have certain views on this issue. Funny enough, not even on unmarried on, on mothers, but when they see young mothers with kids and they're single parents at least, you'd find a, a reaction to that. You know, the first reaction some people have is, what did she do wrong? Why didn't the person stay? How come she had this child so young? You know, you get this immediate response, like maybe you were promiscuous, which is not the truth at all. Some parents would tell their children, like, I know what you're doing, just don't get pregnant. Now, I understand their concern with the getting pregnant part because it's not a toy you're dealing with. This is a child, it's a big responsibility. And older people are aware that maybe young people might not know what they're getting into. But at the same time, it becomes a big hypocrisy issue where if your child does get pregnant now, you know, or it's a cover-up thing, suddenly becomes a sexually active thing, whereas it wasn't before. It's okay to do certain things under certain, you know, contexts and situations, but it's not okay to talk about things openly. How do you deal with a young woman who has been forced into a situation where, hey, your parents don't want you pregnant, you're embarrassing them. The young man who got you pregnant isn't ready for that. And you yourself, don't feel ready, you don't have a supportive environment, who is going to counsel you? There is none. Even if you do decide not to have an abortion, you're still in the same position because you have a lack of support. Good? That is going to affect your schooling because schools by and large do not encourage young women to continue in the school once they're pregnant. And it has nothing to do with the fact that it's illegal. Good? What the school is doing is illegal. What it's doing is immoral and inhumane. Yet, because of our societal structures are put in place, she's pressured into believing that here's what, this is not the place for you, go somewhere else. You know, there's a young mother that I interviewed in the documentary that went to a Catholic school to teach because she's actually a very, you know, strong practicing Catholic. And she went there to teach in a school and they said they wanted to hire her right away. She was very qualified, they were very happy with her. And she had herself told me off camera that she was a little unsure mentioning it, but she mentioned it anyway that she had had a child. So they asked if she was married and she said no. One school, namely Providence, uh, interviewed me that day. Principal said I was perfect for the job, we needed more teachers like me. And yet still told me I won't get it because of the fact that I had a child outside of marriage. Some weeks after that, uh, Central Jacob's Convent, Port of Spain interviewed me. Uh, left me hanging for nine days actually because they wanted me to start immediately. That was before they found out about him. We've adopted a sort of puritanical view, you know, that Maybe now we're getting more liberated and the state is getting more liberated on the outside, but on the inside we still have that view towards women and it's subtle and blatant at the same time, but it's been passed down. And if generations ago, even dating back to the way the Bible was written, women were put down and sort of controlled through their bodies. It would take a really long time to get rid of that. And we might be getting rid of the obvious structures, but the attitudes are still there. All the opinions and all the law books in all religions, written by men. In fact, the monotheistic religions, eh? um, probably I imagine the like Christianity and Islam, and I'm no expert in either one. But to my mind, they seem to be more male-dominated than Hinduism. So, but even Hinduism, in which we have a tradition of worshipping women and treating women in a high fashion, as we say, women are the goddesses in the house. Nevertheless, so, because of the societal pressures and, uh, and societal sort of um, practices, women are still discriminated against. Eh? Even if we realize that this is how we raise little girls and little boys, and that is something we'll have to change if we want to see any overall change. That same thing I was telling you with sex education in girls' schools and not in boys' schools. Um, even how we encourage boys to be, you know, if a boy isn't promiscuous enough, you know, we get worried, we start to wonder what's wrong with him. We start to encourage him, no, go outside, play some more football, get some girlfriends, what's wrong with you? And then the girl has a boyfriend, it's like, don't have free marital sex, if you do, don't get pregnant. It's a totally different socialization. You know, and that has to do with notions about what it means to be masculine and feminine and all that. But that, that's it, it comes back to we're supposed to be the virgins and they're supposed to be the non-virgins. <laughs> you know, they're supposed to be able to have that sexual freedom and we're not. All going back to 
reproductive functions and control. For many people who would like to control women's sexuality, that sexuality must always be linked to fertility in order to ensure that women feel the consequences of their actions. It's almost like if childbirth is a punishment, which of course childbirth should not be seen as. Childbirth should be seen as a joyous, happy, occasion, not as something that you get for committing a sin. It's not a result. It's not punishment for sin. At the end of the day, a woman makes that decision given her circumstances and it's between herself, her doctor, her partner, if the situation is such, and her maker. Yes, I'm a religious person. No, I don't consider myself to be a religious person. I am not religious. I'm trying to, to, to go the right way. Because you know the wrong way, it ain't good. I grew up in church. You understand? I grew up in Catholic. I'm from Catholic. I visit different churches. You understand? And the Holy Spirit of God with me. That's why he sent you all this morning to speak to me. Trinidadians' morals are not in fact determined by their church, their mosque for their mandate. They will pay lip service to that and they will come out strongly against abortion or capital punishment, whatever it is. But in their actions, it's quite different. The problem we have is that we have a paradigm of what society is that is in conflict with what society actually is. We have a paradigm of a human being that is, that is clearly flawed and then we start using these in politics uh, and, uh, and so on. And then we want to say, well, let it be based on Islam. The Islamic view is that if we take a tree of human life, spirituality is the root, morality is the trunk, and all other human activity are branches off of this trunk, so that politics or economics or whatever, branches off the trunk of morality. And what we have done in the, the world today, we have severed the branches from the trunk. And we have also severed the trunk from the root. People think they can have morality without spirituality, without its spiritual moorings and basis which is not possible. Now, the monotheistic religion, what they do, you, you have like God, you have your devil, either good or you're bad. Within the religion, you get salvation. Outside the religion, you, 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 you um, eternal damnation. That's how it is. So everything is black and white. In Eastern religions like Buddhism, in which there is no God actually, right? Or Hinduism, right? Jainism, a lot of Eastern religions, they understand that this idea that there's this benign person above looking down and directing, that's not the case. That the responsibility is yours. That's where the concept of karma comes in. You are responsible. I definitely believe that is a um, multi um, religion in Trinidad and Tobago. Lots of religion. Every religion, every race lives in Trinidad. You'll find it here. Yes, the government should deal with everybody. Not one religion alone. Not the Catholic alone. Not the Catholic alone had the same Trinidad and Tobago. The fact of the matter is Trinidad is a multicultural, multi-religious and multi-ethnic society. The 2000 census figures have shown that almost 43% of the population are Indo-Trinidadians. 37% are Afro-Trinidadians and others of mixed. It also shows that 23% are Hindus, 6% are Muslims, and you have Orishas and you have other traditional African religions in the country. But some people still believe that this is a Christian country. It is not. Well, you have many people and you have certain sections of the media who project that image. I mean, as a foreigner, if you landed at our international airport, you will not dream that 50% of the population are of East Indian descent because there's nothing to indicate to you. If you are from the United States of America, even our tourist board does not advertise the fact that this is a multi-religious and multicultural society. And yet some of the biggest events in this land are Indo-Trinidadian and Hindu events, like Diwali. This is the misrepresentation that takes place at the level of the government and the level of the state. Whether we're talking about the temple or the mosque or the synagogue or the church, they play a major role, which I think is a highly appropriate role for them to play. Religious institutions have a duty of establishing what is morally correct, what is morally appropriate. Religious institutions have a duty to inform and guide us with what they think are the best moral precepts. They have a responsibility to imbuing us, to creating us 
the distinction between right and wrong. They have a responsibility to nurture in us choices so that we make informed, moral, ethical judgments about what is appropriate and what is not for ourselves and for other individuals around us. We can't realistically, I think, just look at a religious viewpoint and say, well, okay, let's apply it and legislate it and let the country abide by it. That's a dangerous precedent to be setting because understanding that religion deals with how you feel and what you think and what you believe. And in a lot of cases, what you believe can be a dangerous thing to plot the course of a country on. Public policy is not about right and wrong. Public policy is about what makes sense, what is good for the community, good in the sense of good in a plural community, or constructive in the sense of what constitutes a public good. But it is not the business of religion to dogmatically determine public policy. If, if religion begins to do that, any religion that begins to do that, we are no longer talking about public policy separate from religion. We are talking about a theocratic state, a state in which it is the theology that determines what is public policy. If we cannot bring um, religious beliefs into it, okay? Not religious principles, because some religious principles do in fact intersect with ethical and moral principles, but that's a different thing. You can make an ethical argument based on very rational principles, but you cannot make an argument based on religious belief and claim to be rational. So, because religious principle, principles of different religions contradict each other in certain ways, right? Uh, for, for this reason, it's better not to bring those beliefs into public policy, um, except and insofar that they affect the religious organization itself in a, in a direct fashion. A good law is a law which is an ethical law and which is addresses the needs of persons in society and that has made a fine balancing between perhaps competing goods, competing rights, competing desirables for the entire society. Morality is for the realm of the church and for the pulpit and for one's personal relationship with one's particular God or gods. Ethics is that very difficult balancing exercise between competing goods or between competing values, competing rights. You have two types of laws, right? You have the secular law, the law of the state, and you have the moral and religious law. These are unwritten laws, this, you know, ethics, values, behavior, interaction. The society develops that. But in, in a multi, in a plural society, as you say, you need the state to put the minimum legislation in place. So you need to have a total sort of paradigm change, a restructuring of a lot of policies and laws. And nobody's going to do that easily. So this is why it's easy to talk of plurality, to put plurality in the practice. It's pretty difficult and it calls for, I mean, really inspired leadership and a sustained effort to do that. We don't seem to have the willingness to take on the, the, the real issues. And I do think that the IRO has, has uh, transformed itself into a, a more uh, a decorative uh, body than a, a proactive body that, that should, be, should be there. You know, and um, uh, it should take uh, proper uh, stands on, on, on major issues. Come out, you know. The problem is that we run into horrendous danger in a plural society where you have different ethics, different um, values. How do you then establish which one is the appropriate dogma? So in a plural society, there is no way that we can allow theology of any one group to be the law of the land. And in fact, we are part of a tradition in the Western Hemisphere which specifically separates theology from public policy, which specifically separates the church from the state. I think we, we, we pride ourselves on being a democratic society, but I think in certain spheres, that democratic right is being restricted, may it be the laws or may it be someone else deciding to, to choose for you. And I really think that people should be able to choose for themselves. This is our society. This is how we think and act. We will not pay bills in December, so we could afford a costume in February. We have to get out of this, I'll deal with it when it gets here, mentality. This is Trinidad and Tobago, to the core. Good? 
from state level to regular level. And we're talking about from national revenue to your paycheck at the end of the month. We'll deal with that when it gets here. Thank you. 